Ooh, Ooh, personally, I love coming to this church. <laughs> That's good. Come on. It is definitely awesome Woo. coming here every Wednesday. Uh, just in case you haven't already come to a Wednesday, or you've come to a Wednesday last week, and we did men's midweek. Uh, during our midweeks where we all come together, we are going through a series. A series on 1st and 2nd Peter. Come on. So this lesson is always sent out on Wednesday. I know for sure because someone's going to remind me as Tegan did today. Come on. Uh, so if you don't have the lesson, nudge the person to your left or right, behind or in front, and they will send you the lesson via email. Mm. So today we're looking at lesson number three, and we're going to be looking at 1st Peter chapter three. And the title of this lesson is The Way of the Cross. Come on. Apply. We've been looking at the cross over the past few weeks, and we've been learning what it means to focus on the cross, to focus on God and to focus on heaven. Today we're going to be looking at how this applies to our relationships. How this applies to our relationships within the church as married, how it applies to our relationship within the church as brothers and sisters, and how this applies to our relationship with those not in the church. Mm -hmm. And when I think of good relationships, Sometimes I, I, I do think of the relationships where I've gotten into trouble with someone right there. Oh. Mm -hmm. uh, there was one time when me and my friend did get suspended from school. Oh. I'm not going to tell you why, it's not, it's not, I'm, I'm ashamed of it, but the friendship itself was good because we stuck up for each other. That's usually what you think of when you think of a good friendship. But today we're going to be looking at what is godly friendships. Okay. It's one thing to steal something and not snitch on your friend. <laughs> but it's another thing to tell your friends to not steal and still love them the way for who they are. Come on. And still love them in a godly way. Mm. So today we're going to be looking at godly relationships okay. when looking at the cross. Point number one, applied to relationships in marriage. Mm. Come on. It says in 1 Peter chapter 3, from verse 1, if you're only reading your Bible, wives in the same way, sub, su uh, be submissive to your husbands, so that if any of them do not believe the word, they may be won over without words by the behavior of their wives when they see the purity and reverence of your lives. Your beauty should not come from outward adornment such as braided hair or, wearing the, or the wearing of gold jewelry and fine clothes. Instead, it should be that of your inner self. The unfailing beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is of great worth in God's sight. For this is the way the holy women of the past, who put their hope in God, used to make themselves beautiful. They were submissive to their own husband, like Sarah, who obeyed Abraham and called him her master. You are daughters. If you are her daughters, if you do what is right and do not give way to fear. Mm. Husbands, in the same way, in the same way, be considerate as you live with your wives and treat them with respect as, weak, as the weaker partner and as heirs with you, heirs with you in the great, in the, sorry, in the gracious gift of life so that nothing will hinder your prayers. The wife to her husband. In the same way, a reference to the discussion of submission, which we spoke about in the last study, to submit to God, to submit to authorities, to submit to whoever is leading in this city, whoever is leading in this world, to submit. We are still discussing what it means to focus on the cross when we talk about submission. And everything we see here in this study applies. The concept of submission to a husband is nothing at all to do with the woman's value. It has nothing to do with taking away her value, her ability or spirituality. She may even be a superior to her husband in a certain way in life. She may have qualities in a certain area that are actually better than her husband. I know uh, Mirari is a whole lot better at sympathizing with people than I am. I know Mirari is a whole lot better at using kind words than I am. Submission doesn't mean to take away a woman's value. 
The last thing any God-fearing man wants to do is take away any value from his wife. The point is that any functioning, purposeful group must have, a, must have leadership. In the same way, this is a marriage. It's just a smaller group, down to two people. It goes from husband to the wife. The husband leads the marriage. In Christian marriage, the style of leadership should be that of the style of leadership Jesus had. Mm -hmm. Now I know I'm only speaking to the leaders, but this also applies to the church. Yeah. The style of leadership must be that of that Jesus had. Yeah. In a non-Christian marriage, however, a wife has no guarantees. Zero guarantees. But still has to submit to her husband. If the husband isn't a Christian, she still must submit. In regard to unbelieving husbands, they can be won over without words. In other words, without nagging. They are won over by the godly submissive behavior of their wife. In verse 3 to 4, Peter discusses the real beauty as defined by God himself. A real, a real beauty is one who is known for character and not for how she looks. Not for her clothing, not for her for jewelry. She is not forbidden to look pretty or to wear dresses, not or to wear nice dresses. But she is not known to be extravagant. And what strikes you when you see her isn't her body, but it's her character. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. It is character over anything else. The unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit is never mm -hmm. out of place or out of style. That's true. Sarah was beautiful. Abraham's wife, she was a beautiful woman. In Genesis chapter 12, we see, I mean, all over Abraham's life, we, we see him in the beginning where he's, he's told a king or a city of people that this Sarah was not his wife. Why? She was so beautiful, he was scared someone was going to kill her, kill him for her. I mean, that's, that's kind of crazy. My wife is so beautiful, you just have to say you're my sister. And I'll give you to this man, and, and I pray he doesn't marry you before we leave. <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah. But she was beautiful. But more importantly, her character made her beautiful in the eyes of God. Yeah. As years took toll over the former type of beauty, the latter type shone even brighter mm. in her life. She obeyed Abraham as her husband. As the scriptures always demand. For it says in Genesis chapter 3 verse 16. To the woman he said, I will greatly increase your pains in childbearing. With pain you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband. And he will rule over you. In Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 22 it says, Wives submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. His body of which... He is the Savior. In Colossians chapter 3, wives submit to your husbands as it is fitting in the Lord. Peter adds that she called him master. Mm. Meaning Lord in Greek. She called him Lord. The same thing we, we said, Jesus, Jesus, you are Lord. Sarah called Abraham. And it it just showed an obedience that was from her heart. She had a heart of obedience to him. She connected to him. And it wasn't a grudging me. There was no reluctance in her following Abraham. Do not give way to fear, however. The fear that submission will not work. The fear that submission will not work for good. For in Romans chapter 8, verse 28, it says, Now we know that all things God works for the good of those who love Him, who have been called according to His purpose. The, the idea of submission, especially submission to non-Christians, demands great faith in the power and design of God to us. Even hard circumstances to accomplish His will. Submission is not a bad thing. The story, there are stories like Joseph and Jesus. 
Out of many other stories, there are stories like these where they submitted to whatever God wanted in their life. Uh, and Josh, Joseph was put in a world by his brothers um, and then made a slave uh, for a couple of years, bought by this official and um, then put into prison because, some, because this official's wife wanted to sleep with him. Uh, there's a whole lot of hardship. Imagine having to go prison, sorry, in a well, into slavery, into being a pretty good servant, back into being in prison, and then finally it ended off with him being a great official in Egypt. Mm -hmm. If we just submit to God's will, we will see a great outcome. Yeah. yeah. Come on, Chris. The passage of time is the greatest test. Mm -hmm. Time is our greatest test in this regard. Mm -hmm. Because it may take months or years to see the marvelous results of God's of the caring hand of the Almighty. Once again, the way of the cross confronts us. The way of the cross is something that is shown to us right here. We have an amazing, challenging path to get on and stay on. Through, uh, though this is pointing mainly towards the married sisters, which is Tegan, uh, Margot, and Marani. <laughs> yeah, I forgot right there. Uh, she is married. Uh, which is pointing towards the married sisters in the church. Don't think that nothing said here cannot be said for single sisters also. Mm -hmm. In the same way, you looking to get married, in the same way you're looking to get married, let your beauty come from within. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I know I'm only speaking to Millie and Jessica right now. <laughs> <laughs> but let your beauty come from within. Let it come from within you. Don't get confused and think that how you dress is what will get you a man. Don't think that you need to be opinionated or respected because a woman with godly, a woman with godly character is respected. She respects, her, she, is, she respects herself already and therefore is respected and heard clearly. These things may not all apply to you men and women. Uh, you guys actually dress with reverence, and you do have beautiful hearts. But when you live in a city like Auckland, when you live in a city like this, where people think the way they look is what will get them attention, where people think the way they must dress is what's going to get them what they want, where there is such a mistake between actual beauty and sexual attraction and lustfulness, we, we can often think that's how we need to be in order to get what we want. Yeah. We often think, okay, we, we've got to look this certain way to get what we want. Mm. But you don't have to look like that. Because it's not true. None of that out there is true. Mm. To the married, your spouse loves you for who you are. So you don't have to dress a certain way. And to the spouse I am talking of, you must love them for who they are also. Though yet, though yet, to get married, we pray that whoever it is you marry, that they love you for who you are also. Mm -hmm. To the singles. <laughs> and now to the husbands. Come on. Here we go, husbands. In the same way, don't think for once you should not submit to your wife just because the Bible says, wives submit to your husbands. Mm -hmm. In the same way, that is in the way of the cross, mm. the way of submission. Although the wife is to submit to the leadership of the husband, the husband is to submit to the needs of his wife. Mm. Submit to the needs of his wife. Talking to mainly Sean and Ian, but and myself right here. Because <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. I read it once, I feel like I, I don't have to say it. Well, I'm preaching to you, Chris. <laughs> Come on, Chris. The husband is to submit to the needs of the wife. In the same way, all disciples are to submit to the needs of other disciples, to the people they disciple. As part of this type of submission, he will show concern and, and, and respect for her opinion when making family decisions. You must ask for her opinion. There is a word for leaders who make, uh, 
abruptly decisions, abrupt decisions, without seeking any input from those whom he leads. He's called an idiot. <laughs> Stupid is the word for a leader who does not ask his, the people he leads. Being considerate. In order to follow this uh, admi ad sorry, admonition, admonition, a husband must study his wife carefully to identify what her needs are. In the same way, Sean studies the church. Sean studies each and every single one of you to find out what you, your needs are. A husband must do the same. I will raise my hand to be the first to say that men do not understand women. <laughs> we don't. All I know is that Merari needs oxygen. <laughs> that's, that's all I know. That's all I instinctly know. Merari needs oxygen. Her body, it, her, her lungs operate the same as mine. <laughs> Although they may last longer when it comes to running. <laughs> but I did not even know the importance of food until I got married. <laughs> Personally, the word hungry was never in my vocabulary. <laughs> I have never used that term before. This is because men and women are actually very different, believe it or not. Very different. A man treats his wife with respect as the weaker partner. This is what the Bible calls men to do. With this time, there are disciples, uh, sorry, within this time, there were disciples that were slaves. And they were even called to respect their slave master. And some of their slave masters were harsh. Still, they were called to respect even the harsh ones. How much more should a Christian husband treat his wife with all the respect he possibly can? She is a weaker partner physically, but in no other way inherently. A wife is normally more sensitive and emotional, but these are not to be mistaken for weaknesses. Yeah. Not at all. I actually consider Mirani's uh, sensitivity to be a strength. It's in like a tool that I don't have. She is someone who possesses something that I actually need and she teaches me what it is, what it means to be sensitive. Because you all know me and you know some of the insensitive stuff I can say sometimes. It wasn't just the other day that I told Ferrari, uh, I'm, I'm, she's not wearing the same ones. Uh, it wasn't the other day that I told Ferrari that her flip sandals kind of matched her skin color. Um, don't use that compliment. No. <laughs> no, don't say that. Even if it's an uh, observation, just keep it to yourself. Or if you really need to get it out, tell a brother to the side. <laughs> yeah. Remember also that in heaven there will be no marriage, and we will all sorry, and we'll all be like the angels. For in Matthew chapter twenty-two, verse thirty, it says. At the resurrection, people will neither marry nor be given into marriage. They will be like the angels of heaven. You had, wow. you had best be careful of how you treat your spouse, of how you treat your wife. Be careful. Otherwise, your prayers will go hindered. Wow. God won't hear your prayers anymore. Wow. God expects us to pray together. It takes learning. It takes learning to be able to do this, husbands. <coughs> As said, it takes learning, studying out your partner in order to know how to be loving, how to be considerate. It takes learning for wives also to know when to express an opinion and to avoid nagging. Mm -hmm. And because you can't change character, because you can't change character as you would a change of clothes, there's always learning more about who you are and who you need to be for that person. So, this week, it was also being able to learn about how other married brothers who are married around about the same time as me have been getting along with their wives also. And I got to speak to one of my best friends. His name is Manuel. And he, just like me, he recently got married to a sister named Effie. And this guy, he is so fired up about his marriage. Aww. He's so fired up about everything to do with his marriage. Man. He loves her with all his heart. Aww. If you hear the way he speaks about it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but we learned from the story which he told me just how different men and women are. And how much he himself is learning. He's actually learning to be sensitive in his relationship. 
The other day he was taking uh, Effie to the hospital. She just needed to, you know, a normal hospital checkup. Uh, and he was on his phone. And he distinctly told me that he remembers asking how she is. He was just looking at his phone at the time. So Effie, how are you? She's, she's a bit nervous, but he's, how are you? And he's working with the ministry and his mind's elsewhere. And he learned later on that that actually is not a very sensitive thing to do. He actually used to look up and say, hey Effie, how are you? <laughs> I'm here by your side. And it just shows how different men and women are. We need to study our spouse in order to really know how to look after them. So, take your spouse to heaven, guys. Take your spouse to heaven. Study your partner and apply the definition of love to them. What is the definition of love? Let's check out 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Love is patient. Love is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud. It does not dishonor others, it is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. Study out the, this, definition, this definition of love and apply it in your life. Apply it to yourself, but don't apply it to them. Mm. We often think that we need to change them. We also often think we need to change the one we're with. Well, if we needed to change them to get to heaven, why do they need us to take them to heaven? Mm. That's a big question. Come on. Mm. Come on, Chris. You taking them to heaven, you're taking them to heaven whether or not they get better or worse. Apply the definition of love to yourself. For men, apply the definition of love based on how you can be considerate and love your wife. For women, apply the definition of love based on how you can be gentle and submissive to your husband. So going away from married people, I see some of you singles, so you're hopeful but you're not there yet. Point number two, applied relationships in the church. Verse, uh, we're going to start from verse, verse 8. Finally, all of you live in harmony with one another. Come on. Be sympathetic, love as brothers, be compassionate and humble. Do not repay evil for evil or insult for insult, but with blessing, because to this you are called, so that you may inherit a blessing. For whoever would love life and see good days must keep his tongue from evil and lips from deceitful speech. He must turn from evil and do good. He must speak peace and pursue it. Finally, here, we're still talking about focusing on the cross. Uh -huh. We're still talking about focusing on the cross right here. What does it mean? What does the way of the cross entail between brothers? Well, for one, it entails unity. A harmony based on sympathy, love, that warm type of love, that friendship kind of love. In Greek, this is known as, known as philo, compassion and humility. Here, there, and below this are more scriptures to help us understand what it means, the subject of unity. A correct response to hurtful treatment in the kingdom. Ideally, we should not actually be hurting each other. Uh, don't hurt each other, don't do it purposely. But again, I'm not sure if you've noticed, we are all human and we're all bound to do it. Yeah. We all tend to, to hurt someone whether or not mean, we mean to do it. Yeah. Uh, the, the fact is that is really just life here on earth. Uh, I for one wish this was not true. I wish it wasn't true that we just tended to hurt each other. I know there are some things that I tend to do which aren't always nice. I remember once before I was in a conversation with Tyrone. Uh, he, he was a great, it was a great conversation. Uh, I may mainly be talking about the food because he took me to TGI's in Australia. Oh. The bad thing I did though, Tyrone was telling me about himself and who he was. Uh, and I, I held back, I didn't really say anything. I didn't really want to give myself that much. Uh, at the end of it, later on, about a couple of days, maybe the next day, I told Tyrone he talks about himself too much and didn't let me talk at all. 
when I chose not to speak about myself at all. I actually insulted him even though I thought I was doing something nice. Uh, and again, I, I apologize for that TY. Mm -hmm. I've definitely learned my lesson now. <laughs> okay. But we all tend to hurt each other. Mm -hmm. our, response, our responses to kind treatment says very little about who we are. About who, our Christ, how Christ-like we are. Mm -hmm. Just because someone's nice to us, it doesn't mean it shows, our, shows how godly we are. Mm -hmm. But our response to an unkind treatment, that says it in levels. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm just how godly we are. Are you treating your brothers and sisters in the church how you think they deserve to be treated or how God thinks they deserve? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. Yeah. There are times where I actually find myself not wanting to speak to someone, not wanting to speak to a brother or sister. But the Christian life is not about me. Mm -hmm. It's not, I don't come to church and I, sh I talk thinking about me. That's not what I'm meant to be doing. Yeah. I'm meant to be coming to church thinking about everyone else. Mm -hmm. I can't call myself a Christian and yet give a fellow brother or sister the silent treatment at the same yeah. time. Yeah. You've got to pick one or the other. And in the same way you're picking to be a Christian or not be a Christian. Yeah. Yeah. Which is it? Focus on God always allows friendships to grow. How many times have you heard someone say, if we weren't Christians, if it wasn't for Christ, we wouldn't be friends. <laughs> it's certainly not an encouraging or loving thing to say, but it is very true. It is very true. And it's true not because of where you would be in life if, you were, if it wasn't for Christ. It's true simply because if you were allowed to be who you are, you would be selfish and not give yourself to that yeah. person. Come on. Come on, you would be too focused on who you are and about you to actually love someone else. Yeah. Do you come to church in this way? Are you focused on the cross in your interactions? Are you focused on Christ as you interact with someone here? Are, you, are, you, and are your interactions awkward because you're trying so hard to get to know someone? Or are they so awkward because you're so resistant to getting to know someone? Why are they awkward? Who do you need to apologize and love today? In verse 10 to 12, again, Sorry, gain and maintaining true unity. Peter quotes uh, from Psalms chapter 34 to show us the ingredients necessary to gain and maintain unity between brothers. It says, Whoever of you loves life and desires to see many good days, keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking lies. Turn from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are attentive to their cry. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil, to cut off the memory, the memory of them from the earth. I'm not sure, whenever I look, read that last bit, the face of the Lord, uh, I, I kind of think of my mom sometimes right there. Uh, has any of you had a mom where she just gives you that look and you oh, stop being yeah. naughty? Yeah. <laughs> my mom would do that. Oh, man. I'll run away. Uh, I knew when I was getting home, my mom would beat me. And it's true, I told her. So my mom sees this, she's going to be laughing right now. <laughs> but that face right there, I just pictured the Lord going, What are you doing? <laughs> Our speech must be honest instead of deceitful. Yeah. You can't tell a brother or sister you love them when you don't even like them. Mm -hmm. True. It's deceitful. Mm -hmm. In fact, when was the last time you said I love you to at least three people in this room? When was the last time? Yeah, you don't have to say it all the time. Your actions do show love to someone. But why not? Mm -hmm. Why not? <coughs> I remember being surprised by Jesse Cross saying I love you to me. I'm not sure if you guys know Jesse Cross. He was in a gang in Australia. Uh, he's a tough guy. He has Sean's beard and uh, Jordan's hair. A bit shorter. A bit shorter. Tyra's beard and Jordan's hair. Uh, but a bit shorter. And Jordan's height. Um, and I'll say, like, yeah, maybe Sean. No. Tyra's build. Um, <laughs> And business a bit different. <laughs> 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 Picture a big mafia guy. There we go. An Australian mafia guy. 
If you think of the top hat and the suit, hey man, but that's that's how I picture Jesse Santos. Jesse was once mentoring Melania and I. Unfortunately, I wasn't very nice to my wife at the time, and he came and he mentored me. He gave me some help, and I said, thank you, Jesse. So he showed me some love when it came to helping me uh, help my wife. And at the end of the phone call, he said, I love you. And I hung up, and I stood there for a while thinking, what did he just say to me? <laughs> did he just say, this is being worth your guy? The other day, he said, he'll kill me. <laughs> but when you hear I love you from someone, it changes everything. Yeah. Why don't you say I love you to the people around you? Mm. We must replace evil behavior with good. Mm. Yeah. We need to be loving and not evil. Mm -hmm. Though so sorry, though so many of us, having been disciples for some time, we have gone into the habit of doing loving things. We can be loving because that's just how we learn to be. It's now a traditional thing instead of a trying to, to do. It's more of a habit now. A good question for you is how have you grown in doing good? I believe that as you get older, you go two ways. You either get more loving, because you kind of have less work to do, and so you focus on your family and you learn to love them more, or you become bitter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The bitterness of life and time just gets hold of you, and you get bitter. And when I think of older people, when I think of loving people, I think of my grandparents. Mm -hmm. They are actually very loving. And it's great seeing them being, uh, how they are loving to one another. My grandfather helps, uh, even though my grandma, my grandfather helps my grandmother, even though he has a hip replacement, he still kind of limps to help her, and he, he does his very best. My grandmother recently had a stroke, mm -hmm. and she does her very best to get up and serve my grandfather as much as she can. And they call each other a team. Mm -hmm. but what's even more loving about them is that whenever they're about to go somewhere. They think of all the people who they know that they're going to pass along the way. Aww. And before they even leave their house, they've called up and have already invited themselves to that person's house. <laughs> they've already said, hey, it's me, I'm coming past, I'm coming to your house. Yeah. And be sure that they'll bring lunch too. When was the last time you did a nice thing and asked your brother or sister to hang out with you? Mm. As I learned when I got married, the diff there's a difference between seeing a person and actually spending time with a person. Mm -hmm. There's a big difference. Just because you see them, it doesn't mean you spend good quality time with them. Mm -hmm. The price of peace must be paid, whatever the cost may be. What are you paying to spend time and do good with your, with your people in this room? Verse 12 assures us that God is watching all that we are and we do. And will respond to our lives, uh, respond to how we deserve. Grow in your brotherly love, guys. Mm. This is my encouragement for you today. Grow in your brotherly love. This is also for the sisters, guys. You can, you know, sisterly love right there. Oh, it's time to start communicating. It's time to start talking to each other. It's time to start calling each other up. Man, if you're in the hood, hit a brother up. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm just going to say that because I'm going to get her once. Oh. Okay. And in other ways, if you're around, please call me up. <laughs> <laughs> Hang out with each other. Compliment each other. When was the last time you said Tyrone, your hair looks good? When was the last time you complimented Wayne's British hat? <laughs> when was the last time you complimented anyone in this room? And especially being of the opposite sex. If you're walking through Grafton, guys, please, knock on my door and come over. I'm not sure if we'll be able to feed you, <laughs> but we certainly have many boxes of tea. <laughs> <laughs> Above all, don't leave your brother or sister without saying I love you today. Mm -hmm. From now on, make it a thing. If you see your brother or sister, or if you're talking to them on the phone, finish that conversation. Mm -hmm. Leave them with I love you. And if you don't, go fix yourself and get the cross. <laughs> Point number three, oh, applied to relationships in the world. Uh, who, sorry, point number three, applied to relationships in the world. First Peter chapter three, oh, right from verse 13. Who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear what they fear. Do not be frightened, but in you, in your hearts, 
Set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you. Pardon me. To give a reason for your help, hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. Keeping a clear conscience so that gent so that sorry, so that those who speak malicely against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. It is better if it is God's will to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. For Christ died for, for sins once for all, the righteousness for, the righteousness for the unrighteous, to bring you to, sorry, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body but made alive by the Spirit. Through him also. He went and preached to the spirits in prison who disobeyed long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. In it only a few people, eight in all, were saved through water. And this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also. Not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a good conscience towards God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of, with angels, authorities, and powers in submission to him. For righteousness. Mm -hmm. According to the word of God, they suffer for righteousness. The pain of it all, it is surprising and shocking. To see this, to see that we must suffer, it really does make me step back a bit. Even Peter's question shows an unexpect, unexpectedness of being harmed for, for doing good. It arouses our fears and frightens us, until we calm down and listen to these scriptures. To quote here from Isaiah chapter 8 verse 12, uh, from verse 12, it said, but in Isaiah chapter 8 verse 13, it continues on. Isaiah goes on to give them the remedy of their fears. It says in this verse, The Lord Almighty is the one you are to fear. He is the one you are to dread. And He will be a sanctuary. What do we gain from fearing God and seeking sanctuary in Him? It helps us keep Jesus as Lord in our hearts. It helps us keep prepared to defend our faith without being deceptive, but being gentle and respect, uh, respectable. It helps us keep a clear conscience. Persecution make, makes righteousness our constant goal when we're persecuted. For we must judge our words and actions in respect to how God would see them. Not in how people will see them or how we feel they do, uh, them, they're valued. Mm -hmm. Asking ourselves how this looks from God's perspective. It helps us keep convicted, keeps convicting those who manifestly slander our good behavior. So do you fear God enough to treat non-Christians with respect? Or do you think God is not enough and you need to give them your peace of mind? Come on, Chris. Slander and gossip are still sins, yeah. whether or not they're done to a Christian or a non-Christian. Mm -hmm. Whether or not they're done to a person in this church or out of this church. Who are you lacking respect towards mm -hmm. in your life? Mm -hmm. Is it your boss? Your co-worker? Who are you lacking respect? In the word, Christ suffered for righteousness. The pain of it all, he died for sins. And thankfully, it was once and for all. Yeah. Yeah. As he was put to death by the word in his body. Yet, he was nothing but righteous in his life. There was one philosopher who once said, if a person could ever embody complete truth, the world would fall at his feet. That philosopher was ignorant both of Jesus and of the clash between evil and truth. And in fact, one day, everyone will bow to Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. What do we gain from it all? He took our place on the cross. He took, on our he took our place on the cross. 
the righteousness for the unrighteous. You are living a life you don't deserve. Yeah. Really, you guys are living a life you don't deserve. How much do you really understand that? Mm. How much do you really understand your, your undeservingness for the world, for this life? Personally, I don't think anyone will completely understand this. It's just something we can't. Yeah. It's something that we just can't get. But are you living your life as though you are grateful? Yeah. <coughs> he arose from the dead to settle the death issue. To de settle the death issue once and for all. He preached to the spirits in prison. Uh, but if you also want to find out what that means, continue studying the next bit out, next bit out as it goes into a search as to what it means of him uh, preaching to the spirits in prison. Uh, point number D. It says, uh, live a God, live a godly life, and believe God's got your back. Mm -hmm. that, there's a challenge for that one. Live a godly life and just believe that God will judge others uh, for how they treat you. So, in conclusion, uh, coming in for a close. Point number one: apply it to your marriage. You are you are a godly partner leading your spouse to heaven. Hmm. Apply the definition of love to yourself. For men. Base this on how you can be considerate and loving. For women, base this on how you can be gentle and submissive. Apply it to relationships in the church. Sorry, love. <laughs> love your family. Uh, it's time to communicate, guys. It's really time to begin commu communicating with each other. Again, if you're in the hood, hit a brother up. <laughs> Hang out with each other. Compliment each other. Yeah. Compliment each other on whatever it is that you like about them today and let it be truthful and let it come from the heart. Mm. Above all, don't leave here today without saying you love, saying I love you to one of your brothers or sisters. And point number three, apply to, relation, apply to relationships in the words, leave God, sorry, live a life, a godly life, and believe God's got your back. Okay. Go to your <laughs>